This is the Hollywood Outsider. I am your host, Aaron Peterson. With me today are my co-host, Scott Clark. Hey, how's it going, Aaron? Great. Justin McCumber? <laughs> How are you doing, man? Well, not nearly as happy as you are. And Brian Williams. <laughs> hey, guys. Hey, how's everybody doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. Not really? as jolly as Justin right now, apparently. <laughs> uh, if only everybody heard the show, the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they should listen to the outtakes. That's usually where the fun stuff is. Yes. <laughs> just yes. fast forward to the end. <laughs> yeah, just, just skip the end. We don't have anything else relevant to talk about. <laughs> just for real quick, for those that are tuning in for the first time, we are an entertainment podcast where each week we talk about the latest in movie and TV news. We review any new releases. This week we're reviewing Cabin in the Woods and Lockout. We play two trivia games, Stump the Ho and What's This Movie? Every week we share a flashback DVD of a little known or obscure movie f- with uh, from one of our podcasters to leave you with. And we have a topic from the outside in that's a weekly topic on ours or our listeners' minds. This week we're going to get a little nostalgic and share our favorite summer blockbuster memories. Aww. And you can always subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or anywhere else you can find an RSS feed. You get a new episode every week with that. How is everyone? Living the dream, brother. What's the dream? Vacation. Not working. Vacation. Yeah. I got uh, a week I don't off. know if in America right now you really want to say living the dream is not working. <laughs> Good point. Well, fuck, man. I've been living the dream for years. <laughs> Welcome. No, I got a week off uh, just do, sitting at home doing nothing. I'm really, really enjoying it. I, Getting caught up on some video games, watching some TV shows. So being a total mature adult? Yeah. Come on. Give me, it's one week out of the year. Give me a break. <laughs> That's true. Good call. <clears throat> Anybody else done anything fun? I haven't done anything. Nothing. I had oh. my teeth worked on today. You had your teeth worked on? Yes, had to go into for a dental visit, apparently. One of my root canals that I had done had gotten infected, so they had to go in and fix this root canal, and so one half of my face is really hurting. But I'm trying to put a smile on it <laughs> and uh, laugh through the pain. Drugs, man, drugs. Oh, uh, whoever invented Xanax, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know what I would do without that. Oh, that's cool. Well, I'm glad you survived and nobody pulled your teeth out. No, not yet. Well, let's start with movie news just to get into it. One of the first things that came out, this kind of surprised me, is Justin Timberlake and Ben Affleck are teaming up in Runner Runner. It's about an offshore online gaming outfit and the tense relationship that develops between a student and mentor. I'm assuming Justin Timberlake is a student. You, you scoff at this. Does this sound stupid to you? Um, yes, oh, it does. Why? It just sounds silly. Okay. Silly. What about it sounds silly? The fact that Justin Timberlake and Ben Affleck are teaming up, I don't really like either one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, like your Tim- personal like- feelings aside. <laughs> That's all. I like, Timber- I like Timberlake, but, you know, it kind of sounds like the, uh, what's the Al Pacino, Matthew McConaughey movie, Two for the Money Two or the One? Money, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, something like that, which on the surface kind of sounds like a good movie, but it's probably just shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I'm i one of those few people in the world who really does not have a complete hate on for Ben Affleck, and I've never really understood what it was it's called he Games. did to earn the, the, the animosity of, of so many people. I, I, I really enjoyed... I wouldn't say everything he's ever done because, granted, he's done some crap. But the Geely. guy was fant- well. I mean, I've never seen Geely, so I can't speak to that. I was warned off of that one well in advance. But as much as people didn't like Daredevil, I thought he was just fine in that. I loved him in Chasing Amy. I really liked him in Boiler Room. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the guy has turned in some some really good performances, and I, I in a movie like this where it seems to be more of a drama of him being some kind of business founder, online gambling with Timberlake. You know, I've not read the script, so I really have no more info than that. But I find the two of them incredibly charming. I think the premise sounds interesting. So, sure, I'm all for checking out more about this one. I, I really I think Affleck gets a, a lot of crap he shouldn't be getting, but I like Affleck as a director and a writer. I don't like him as an actor. Is that fair? It's it's not. I mean, I've seen him in a couple of things where I thought he was okay. I think he's really good in supporting roles. I just don't really like him as a lead actor because he just he seems very bland to me, mm-hmm. me personally. So and mm. Timberlake, I just I just feel like 
you know, the whole time he's in a movie, I just keep thinking, eh, he's not bad, but he should probably be on a stage. I don't get the hate for Timberlake. I thought he, I really liked him in Social Network. Well, you have like some kind of sick obsession with him, though. Yeah. Like you have a poster <laughs> over, over your bed, not next to it, like over it. I really don't. So when he's laying in bed, he just looks up and goes, oh, I wish you'd bring sexy back. <laughs> he's got his JT lunchbox that he takes to work every day. You know it Justified. <laughs> Dressing up oh. in big old liquor bottle. Oh, oh. <laughs> Bring it on down to liquor town. <laughs> uh, next piece. This actually is exciting for me. Universal is developing a Rockford Files movie with Vince Vaughn, the star is Jim Rockford. And if you guys, for for the younger people, that's uh, Jim Rockford was one of the first TV anti-heroes. He was a guy that was released from prison, became a private detective, and just all around sarcastic, son of a bitch, etc. Yeah, he was, you know, he was one of those like first kind of complex type of, uh, like you say, anti-heroes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a little bit, you know, it was, I don't remember specific episodes. I do remember the show. Uh, it ran for the most part of all, of, just about all of the 70s. And, uh, you know, I just remember him kind of being a a sort of, he a guy that he really didn't like conflict. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he he's just about as, as more apt to run from a fight as jump into a fight. That's why I liked him. Yeah. And um, so, the, you know, and Vince Vaughn, which enough, once I, I kind of rolled my eyes when I first saw Vince Vaughn uh, attached to it, but he's got kind of the same build and he is, I can see him kind of talking his way out of, out of situations. Yeah. It's the, the charming thing. That's what right. I, I hope he can bring to it. Cause Jim Rockford yeah. is a real charming kind of guy and Vince Vaughn is just more of a motor mouth yeah talk yep. his way out of this kind of thing I could see him talking his way out of a lot of things but I don't know if he's got to be real suave and kind of cool when he needs to be but I don't know it's a great show I really just hope they don't do the Starsky and Hutch route that's oh. all I don't want them to do seriously don't make a joke out of it because you could make a good movie out of it good nice little action crime comedy if if they take it seriously but Vince Vaughn from the other TV adaptations he's done don't seem like he takes it seriously well, the Avengers, uh, even though the film has been completed and is doing screenings, they can convene for a one-night-only shoot that's supposed to be some kind of a curtain call. That's very hush-hush. But apparently, when this thing hits theaters, everybody needs to stay long after the credits because there's there's supposed to be one more scene that they just filmed, literally just filmed it because they want to keep it a secret. Yeah, uh, earlier this week I was listening to a podcast, and one of the guys who was on it had gone to see the premiere for the Avengers. And while apparently they were under a non-disclosure kind of agreement that they wouldn't speak about their feelings, which really seems odd given the fact that you want good word to come out as early as possible. And just about everything I've heard about the Avengers has been nothing but astonishingly good. He indicated that the the film was really, really good, but that uh, of course, as with all the Marvel movies, you need to stick around through the credits because there was going to be a little teaser for whatever's coming up next. And he said that luckily they do it kind of midway through the trailer, the credits, as opposed to waiting until everybody, the grandmother and PETA, you know, Mm -hmm. it's told and when thanked, um, he said it's, it's pretty early through the credits. So you don't have to wait that long. Well, if this is true, then maybe there are two different stingers that they're putting into the films credits. And if so, that's really kind of fucking cool. Supposedly, they, from what I've read, now I can't say 100% because I don't work for, for Disney, but from what I've read, they are they filmed this last minute because they wanted it to be secret because so many things had been leaked out. <clears throat> so they wanted to have this last minute so they could tack it to the end right before it hits theaters. That way nobody has seen it, not even critics. Right. So it won't be spoiled. So the people that see it first are the ones that are going to know what it is. And I will be seeing it midnight. Yep, I think it'll be a midnight show for me as well. Yeah, that's a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah, I'll actually be seeing in the theaters for 12 hours watching Iron Man, Incredible Hulk, <laughs> Iron Man 2, <laughs> Thor, Captain America, and then bam, the Avengers. Good Lord, that's um, a long day. Yeah, there's a lot of And only 20 around. bucks. I was rather shocked at how cheap they it's were doing it. 20 bucks, but you can you will have so many intestinal problems by the time you're done. With all <laughs> well, I'm hoping they'll let us bring in food cuz I ain't eating popcorn for 20, <laughs> 20 hours doubt give it. or take. I highly That's doubt it. That's a whole lot of Jew bears for one evening. Oof, that is a lot of Jew bears. <laughs> 
Speaking of Jew bears, another another film that's being planned is the JFK assassination. <laughs> you don't like that transition? I don't even know what it means. It makes no sense. And JFK have to do, but all right, run with it. I don't know. It was around World War II. Um, <laughs> Not really, but all called, right. The Cold sure. World War II. It was like 20 years later. Years, 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 later. Okay. Not, I don't have a history book, motherfucker. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> anyway, well, outside of that classic uh, Kevin Costner film from many years back, there's another JFK film that's being planned for release around the 50th anniversary of his assassination, which I think is kind of sick that they're celebrating the 50th year he got shot. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> um, but whatever. He got shot November 22nd, 1963, so for next year, they want to have a film ready to be told from the Secret Service men that protected him's point of view, which I can tell you how that one ends. <laughs> Very sad. Failure? <laughs> yeah. There better be a whole lot of, uh, I'm sorry, or, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, so. <laughs> Just a lot uh, of guys. It's, uh, it's going to be an interesting, I think it's going to be an interesting perspective, uh, but it's, I don't think, it's, it's not going to clear anything up, I don't, I don't think. So, Whatever. Uh, you know, Oliver Stone's not doing it, so that at least it shouldn't be a four to six hour movie. I actually like that movie, like the, oh, the original it's theatrical. A, I, I, it's a really good movie, and it's it's an interesting take on the on the I guess because it, it's more of a theory of what happened than actual actually what happened. But so uh, it's every theory that happened. <laughs> it's not it's not like I'm one theory. Saying. It's every single theory that's ever been posed. That's what I was going to say. I can't help but wonder. You know the controversy over this, how it's going to be played out in the film, because there's a ton of questions left unanswered. You know, and that was what the what the Oliver Stone movie was about. It was like mm -hmm. about the different different ones and what happened and what the different theories were. Did you ever see it? I Not the whole thing. I saw I bits and pieces it. of it. It's it was a good? pretty good movie. Yeah. But I don't know. This just seems like one of those touchy subjects that'll cause more arguments than a quality film experience. Hmm. I I really like real life. Films like that, like real crime films, mm -hmm. as long as they're addressing. See, I don't want to see a movie about the turmoil that they took because they didn't protect them. And I don't want to see that movie. I saw that. It was in the line of fire, <laughs> you know, and Clint Eastwood did it better. So I, I really have no desire. Speaking of Secret Service men, Harrison Ford, Gary Oldman, who were in Air Force One together. This is an odd reuniting. Uh, and Liam Hemsworth, who is uh, Chris Hemsworth's brother, the guy that yes. plays Thor. It's his brother. He played Gale he's in, in Hunger Games. He's in the Hunger Games. Yeah. Right. They're teaming up on a movie called Paranoia, and it's based on a book by Joseph Finder, which I'm not really familiar with. But it's about an employee of a tech corporation who breaks the law and is given the choice between going to jail or spying on his competition. Now, I've not read this book, but I really like this story idea. Yeah, I think it's this really, is really cool. interesting. And, and I'm a big fan of Gary Oldman, a really big fan of him. And it excites me because I, I didn't have a whole lot of interest in seeing that Tinker, Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy movie. Mm -hmm. The story just interests me a whole lot, so I'm looking forward to seeing him in a role that in the, in the story that interests me a lot more. And this just seems like a really cool story. I think it's interesting how he has, they have a choice between going to jail and spying on the competition. That's kind of a clever yeah. concept. Yeah. Can they, hmm. can they do that? I mean, I don't know. I'm well, assuming it's his employers that yeah, figure out him. what he's done and they're like, well, we'll either turn you in or you can use your powers for our benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do they get him a job at the other, at the competitor? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Call in a favor. Phone a friend? I don't know. You, you know, just Verizon say, okay, look, you guy, you know, Aaron, you screwed up here, so you can either be fired and arrested, or we can get you a job at AT and T. Well, you could probably get in the door because of your experience with the other yeah. company. I mean, they think they're getting the benefit there. See Unless he comes in looking shifty, <laughs> shave off the goatee, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> well, now let's move on to Brian's segment. This is my favorite part of our of the show that we do, because this is where we get to talk about all the new trailers coming out. So welcome to Brian's trailer park. Yes. Ba, 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 ba. All right. No, sorry. <laughs> That's where we would put in some, like some hokey music and everything, but, uh, Little banjo. but actually, <laughs> exactly. I, I like it better when you try to do it yourself. <laughs> uh, is that what the banjo sounds like, <laughs> no, apparently it sounds like a marching band. <laughs> a couple of movies, uh, this week. Uh, the first one is a, a, Sequel to a classic cinema, Piranha 3 Double D. <laughs> uh, I don't know who approved this to be made, but it's got I David Hasselhoff them. and Gary Busey in it. So I don't care how many 3D boobies they got in this movie. This is just going to be, this has got to be a, one of the worst things made this year. <laughs> what uh, what is it about? Say that. <laughs> what is it about? 
Pir piranhas find their way out of the rivers and the lakes and wherever it was they were in the first one. They find their way into the city sewer system and invade a water park. <laughs> that cracks me up. It yeah. does. Here's what I don't get. If there's piranhas in the pool, <laughs> one thing, get out of the pool. Why Why would they be in the fucking pool? I don't, that well, makes no sense. I'm just saying, it's, it's like one of those concepts that they're in the pool, get out of the pool. They can't follow you. <laughs> I saw them. I saw the trailer that's on their website, and mm -hmm. yes, they absolutely can follow you. <laughs> they absolutely can follow. You. They can get into bathtubs. Apparently, this movie looks hilarious. Like, uh, I think it looks funny. When Christopher Van Lloyd Rames pulls out his shotgun legs, it is on <laughs> like Donkey Kong. Wasn't that a rip off of the? A little bit of the kind of hair from yeah. Grindhouse, sure. Who gives a shit? It looks hysterical. <laughs> it does look funny. <laughs> oh, God. This oh. is not a movie you can even begin it, to try and take seriously or right. look for logic, look for any kind of facts. Just go in looking for boobies and blood, and you should be well entertained. <laughs> and it it looks like a Grindhouse trailer. Like, yeah. It, it, yeah, it looks it, horrible. It looks like a fake movie, and yeah. it's not... It looks horrible. I don't know. I recommend saving yourself a few bucks and look up the Red Band trailer. They're not in 3D, but you probably get the same effect as, you know, paying 10 bucks and going to see it at a movie. Oh, no, I want to see that. You know what are in 3D? Real boobs. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, but we know it's been a long time since you've seen those. <laughs> so, um, the next speaking one. Speaking of time. Speaking of. <laughs> uh, the next one is a little bit deeper. Uh, it's got. Bruce Willis and Joseph Gordon-Levitt in a what appears to be pretty much a mind fuck as far as uh, time travel goes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Looper, and it involves Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who you may recognize from Inception. He's a uh, he's a base kind of like a time cop type of thing. He goes back in time and uh, and has to take out people in the future. Mm -hmm. Well. Lo and behold, one guy pops up in front of him that he's there to, to take out, and it's him in the future. And that's kind of where the, I guess, this whole paradox and mind fuck come into play. So this looks, to me, this looks good just for the originality of it, personally. And yeah. I love a movie. I like sci-fi. And anything that kind of screws with your head a little bit, I'm all in for. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I'm sure. What do you think? What do you think, Justin? Because I know you're kind of more, you, you're absolutely... You know, a sci-fi guy. I, I, as soon as I saw the trailer, I, I really loved it. I'm hoping that they limit Bruce Willis a little bit, because as as I get older and he gets older, I find him to be increasingly irritating because he really doesn't act. He's always just Bruce Willis, and, and <laughs> he's become a type. Whereas Justin Gordon Gordon Levitt is can act circles around him, and so I'm kind of hoping that they limit how much of Bruce Willis is in it, how much he has to act against it. But just that idea of, of putting killers back into the past that you send your enemies to, to knock off. And so now dead in the past, the, the, the police of the future can't find them. It's almost a foolproof way of getting rid of your enemies to suddenly find a future version of yourself. It's a fantastic premise. And a lot of people are, trying to compare it a little bit to Inception, I, I don't think the comparison really works. But on that level of just mindfuckery, it, it, it could. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how this one goes. Yeah, well, we look forward to it. <clears throat> and keep in mind, you can always find the trailers that we talk about on the website at thehollywoodoutsider.com, trailers, recent episodes. And if you have a thought or a topic idea, you can always find us on Twitter at H underscore Outsider, or please like us on Facebook.com forward slash The Hollywood Outsider. Stump. The Ho. Stump the Ho. That's our weekly little trivia contest between our podcasters for one podcaster tries to stump the other hoes. That's Hollywood Outsider, not actual prostitutes. This week, it's Justin's turn. Justin, stump us hoes. All right. Before I do this, can I offer a quick clarification about something we talked about a week ago? Okay. At least either last week or the week before, we talked about the Total Recall trailer. And I voiced my concern that we never saw... Mars. Mars. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was reading the Entertainment Weekly from last week, and apparently, even though this is a redo of the the film, they are not following it one hundred percent. And one of the things they're not doing is actually they will not be going to Mars. That seems like a they're, big thing they're not following. 
and I think that's fine because the the movie itself is an adaptation of a book. I I, I don't think they needed to go to Mars, and I kind of I'm kind of glad that I can now go into it knowing not knowing exactly where this thing is going. So, for any of you who might have been like me and wondering where the fuck is Mars and when are they going to get their ass to it, they will not. And I, and I kind of think that's cool. <laughs> okay. All right, question. Uh, I knew the Avengers was going to come up, and so I wanted to find a question that might stump my hoes and all of our ho listeners out there. So here we go. Lou Ferrigno first played the Hulk in the TV series back in 1977, Mm -hmm. and he's provided the voice of the Hulk, and he's providing the voice of the Hulk in the upcoming Avengers film. Mm -hmm. He's played the Hulk in one capacity or another in almost every version of the character produced since 1977 but he didn't have a hand in the portrayal of the hulk in which of the following a the 1988 telefilm the incredible hulk returns b the 1996 to 97 animated series the incredible hulk c ang lee's feature film the hulk or d the more recent edward norton incredible hulk Scott? I'm going to say D, the uh, Edward Norton one. All right. Brian? I'm going to go with C, the, the Ang Lee version. Okay. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to go with Ang Lee as well, mostly because he doesn't do anything that makes sense. So, boom. Well, that, and, uh-huh. I, and, I, and I actually re- well, I actually remember him playing a security guard in that movie. Oh. Right. Now you said but not- he also played in a security guard in the Edward Norton film as well. You said not as the Hulk though, right? You're being very specific on the, he didn't right. do anything related to the, okay, gotcha. Right. But we, he did play a security guard in both Ang Lee and the more ed, recent Edward Norton film of the Hulk. Gotcha. Well, we will find out the answer to that a little later on in the podcast. So you guys can stew on that right now. Let's go on to the big screen. Scott. Uh, first thing we're going to do is going to do a quick recap of last week's episode. It was episode 37. Uh, the first thing we talked about was uh, the, the releases that are coming out on on uh, April 20th. The first was the Tim Allen-voiced uh, documentary Chimpanzee, which is currently getting a 63% on Rotten Tomatoes. That was both Brian and Aaron's picks for the week. Um, my and Justin's pick was The Lucky One, which is uh, written by the same guy that did The Notebook. Uh, that's currently sitting at a 55% on Rotten Tomatoes. And then the last uh, one there uh, it was Think Like a Man, which none of us picked as our favorite. That is the, uh, oh, what's his name? The short guy, the short black guy comedian. Can't remember his name. It's escaping me. But Kevin uh, Hart. Kevin Hart. Thank you. You're welcome. 56%. Um, we also did our reviews of American Reunion, which uh, I reviewed. And then uh, Aaron also reviewed Titanic 3D, which I recommend checking that out. Okay. Now this week we are going to review two new movies. The first one is called Cabin in the Woods. Justin, dear God, will you tell us what this is about without spoiling it? Oh, uh, and it's so hard because, all right, anybody <laughs> who's watched the trailer knows that this is a horror film, but that there are some strange, un, unanswered sci-fi elements to it. And well, if you've seen the posters and any kind of advertising, it's telling you this film is not what you think it's going to be. And I went into it knowing exactly that. I knew it was horror, some weird sci-fi. I think I kind of know where this might be going, but let's sit down and watch it. So my brother and I go to the theater. We sit down. I am a massive Joss Whedon fan. I've loved the stuff that he's done with Drew Goddard, who directed this film, uh, though the both of them wrote it. And I sat down and prepared myself to watch this movie. By the time it was done, I was thrilled that I had no idea what was going on because where the story went was so far to the left of where I thought it was going. I delighted in that. I loved the dialogue. I thought these characters, it's got Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard all through it, especially at the beginning when you're just getting to know your characters and they're, you know, these five young kids, kids, Anybody younger than now 30 to me as a kid. These five (laughs) college student aged characters who are getting together to go on a little vacation to the cabin in the woods and just the camaraderie, the fun, the humor. It's hysterical, but it starts leading you really early on that there is this other storyline going on that is 
matching up with them and somehow intersecting. You don't know how, why. Through the whole film, you're trying to figure out what do these characters have to do with our horror, you know, in the woods characters. It is fantastic. It is. I was so blown away by how good this movie was that when it was done, I wished I could have told the person back in the projection booth, rewind that fucker and let's do this all over again. <laughs> I give it an easy nine out of 10. It was fan fucking tastic. Brian. And that's you... as much as I can do without spoiling shit. <clears throat> what did you think, Brian? <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't suck the seed of Joss Whedon. Like, like, you know, you two guys, Aaron. And, it is and so Justin. sweet. It is like honey. Uh, and, and after watching this movie, I pro I couldn't, you know, I'll I believe you because this this was movie was f- absolutely phenomenal. Um they you actually care about the characters mm-hmm. fairly, you know, fairly quickly. It did a really good job of of making you not want to have anything happen to them, even though you know <laughs> you know shit's gonna happen to them. Uh but like you say, it it just it goes in a direction that you just you just don't you just don't see it coming, and it just keeps and, it, and then after that it just keeps going it just keeps making these turns and and stuff and by the end of it you're like, what the hell? Mm-hmm. There's a lot. If you're a cinephile, if you if you if you got if you like horror movies and and you've seen a lot, just pay attention because there's a lot of little nods, little homages to horror movies. Mm-hmm. So. uh I, I I picked up at, I mean probably seven or eight maybe ten. Didn't it kind of remind you with of Scream to some degree of how it turned the con, the natural conventions on their ear mm-hmm. to some you know. it, in a way you know my wife kept she kept referring to thirteen ghosts yeah I could see that you know and I I kind of agree to a certain extent we got in a little argument about it but that's good you should always get divorced go. over a movie yeah yeah but I mean but even. I mean, even after the drive home, we get home, you know, we still were talking about it probably an hour and a half or so after the movie was over and just like, man, what about this? And what about that? And in any movie that does that, I mean, I've got to give it a high mark. So I definitely give it a, a nine out of 10. Wow. And so everybody that has never tuned in before, we rate things on if $10 is the full price of admission, how much would we pay? So that's two nines. And it sucks to talk about this movie without talking about this movie. Yeah, because <laughs> it is really one of those movies where you don't want to spoil it. It's kind of, it's like, like, I'm, describing, I'm, it's kind of like describing The Sixth Sense. And Brian and Scott were both the people that aren't really Joss Whedon nuts, like like mm-hmm. Justin and I. But go ahead. Right. Yeah, th- this is so hard to talk about because it's, it's not as bad as The Sixth Sense because The Sixth Sense, you just can't reveal the end. Yeah, you can't you reveal I mean? the movie. Like this is <laughs> – this is, things are revealed to you within the first five minutes of this movie – that throw you for a complete loop if you've if you've only watched the original trailers. This movie was so much fun. This is the most fun I've had in a, in a movie this year. Granted, we're only in April, mm-hmm. but it was just from start to finish. This movie was just so much fun. Uh, Brian kind of stole my thunder, but I, I've never seen a horror movie where I cared so much about the characters. I didn't want anything bad to happen to any of them. Even the even the jock wasn't a douchebag. He was he was intelligent guy. The, the the stoner guy was a lot of fun. You, you liked he, him. He was worried about. It. I thought he was going to be a little one note, but he ended up being pretty good. Oh, yeah, it was great. I mean, even the 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 dumb blonde, the stereotypical dumb mm-hmm. blonde that was in it. You know, she she, they all got along, and it and it made and it made sense. You wouldn't think that a movie with, you know, a jock and a and a and a cheerleader type character and a stoner guy and a and um just a nobody girl are going to get along, but they all did. They all got along really well, and it was a lot of fun. And so. that that blonde chick. I've never wanted. I've never thought making out with a wolf head would be hot. <laughs> oh, she made that hot. She made that so hot. <laughs> she did. I'm not gonna so lie. Hot. So, uh, yeah, the, the, it just takes such interesting turns. So much, so much fun. I was so confused, uh, but in a good way. And I, I think I said this on my on my review on the Facebook page. Is like they give you the perfect amount of information along the way at just the exact amount, exact right places mm-hmm. that kept you on the edge of your seat the entire time. I sincerely love this movie. The only, the only downside I, th- I said to it, and I actually, I originally gave it a 9.5. I'm going to give it a nine, nine mm-hmm. out of 10. Um, now that you had some time to, to sit on it. Yeah. Cause I, I came out of the theater just, just high on this movie. And um, the, the only thing I had walking out of the theater is I thought some of the production of some of the, uh, 
Again, I'm trying to say this without, without some no, of the stuff going on. Don't we, we're going to talk more as a group when we get our reviews right. out. So. But the, some of the stuff looked a little a little more homemade than I yeah, would have liked. I see that. That makes sense. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the only other negative thing I can say about this is, while well, Justin said he would like to have just rewound it and watched it again right off the bat, this is, a, this is a movie that I'll never enjoy as much as I did the first time. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of a one-and-done thing a little bit just because the appeal of the movie is – What's going on and figuring it out, and once you know it, I don't know that it would be as much fun to watch it. And re- rewatchability is a big thing for me, so that's the mm-hmm. only reason I, I dropped it to a nine. But solid nine out of ten, I it's so much. Yeah, fun. but with a movie like this, the joy that I find is 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 looking for okay, how did I miss it? Right. What was I missing? And then now that I'm not so busy looking for what is the twist, now I get to more fully enjoy the actual performances. Sure. I liked The Sixth Sense as much the second time around as I did the first, just in a completely different way. Mm-hmm. No, I so I think there's replayability here. That's, that's fair. I honestly felt it was almost more of a bloody comedy than it was a horror movie. Yeah. But it definitely it definitely had horror moments. Um, it's a rare horror movie that I didn't see coming, uh, and I usually have this stuff figured out. I did have it figured out fairly early, but I really didn't think they were going to go the route that I thought yeah. that I had it figured out. I'm like, well, that's what I think it's going to happen, but there's no way they're going to do it. And then they did it. <laughs> Wow. Awesome. Congratulations. Ending. So good. And I will say, as much as I'm a huge Joss Whedon fan, and the reason being is that um, if you ever watched his shows, he has a very specific writing style. Mm-hmm. Like the episodes that he writes, you know that he wrote them. Would you agree, oh, Justin? Yeah. Justin, yeah. especially? Because yeah. you've seen all the shows. Um, and this movie, it's very reminiscent, I would almost say, of the Angel Universe, which. A bit. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, bit. yeah, I almost thought that this could have been. Almost a side story to either season four of Buffy or of Angel, because mm-hmm. there's there are elements to it that echo things you've seen in his other properties. Very much. But the one thing I was very happy about, which because we didn't write so specifically, cause, and he did write it with um, Drew Goddard, who's also a Buffy and Angel writer. Right. But the one thing that I will say that these guys did is I think Whedon did, specifically did a very good job of not writing Whedon-esque. You know what I mean? I, mm-hmm. I think when he wrote the characters, he wrote them to be more natural. They weren't too cutesy. They weren't too cutesy. They weren't too f- overly clever, except for the pothead, which he was supposed to be. But everybody else seemed very natural, seemed like real people. And that's not an attribute of Whedon's characters. Normally, his are very clever and, and very unique. You you know, oh, Joss Whedon wrote that. You know, you can tell. This this was very much more of a natural horror movie, which is a crazy-ass plot. Mm-hmm. And And the fact that the only thing that I had some issues with were the special effects were a little weak in one or two areas like you were talking about. And I did get frustrated more than once when they would cut away from the tension for a joke. Um, that Because there were a couple spots where I just, uh, you know, it was real tense and then it cut away for a joke. And yes, it was funny, but also part of me is like, motherfucker, really? <laughs> <laughs> to, to, and some, a couple of those spots, I thought that was awesome. And a couple other spots, I'm like, I'm going to stab somebody if you don't go back to what I was watching. Like but, the one, a, the one big they, It kind of plays in to the fact that they, they a couple of times they, they, they build up the tension. I guess they don't, just because there's tension, they don't have to do something. Or they, they didn't necessarily do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to cite specific parts. Right. But, you know, there were a couple of times where, you know, there, there really wasn't much tension and, and bam, something happens and then vice versa. You know, the, hey, there's a lot of tension and you're like, Oh, okay. All right, I can relax now, or laugh, whatever the case is. So, I, I I I kind of agree with you on that point, but I think it's it was just part of the the formula that they were using yeah. to kind mm-hmm. of keep you on your toes and keep that what the hell's going to happen next type of feeling going on in your head. It was a movie that was very focused on straying away from convention. Oh, absolutely! Right. This is the most creative horror movie I've seen in years. Mm-hmm. years. And I like that a lot of the jokes that they cut away to actually got paid off. Later yeah. in the film, yeah. when shit starts to really go and fucking in particular, crazy. Yeah. There's several in particular, not just the one you're thinking of. There's there's a lot, and there, the one thing, and this is where I go to rewatchability because you brought that up, uh-huh. is that I think, and we can't really say without explaining the plot, which I'm not going to do. But once you see the movie and you see how it how it how the story completes, I think if you go back, there's a lot of things to rewatch because there's a lot of things to look Absolutely. for. There's a lot of things to to pick up on now. I mm-hmm. think that you you wouldn't have guessed the first time. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of that in there because I think that's the kind of movie it was designed to be. Mm-hmm. The only thing that I, w- I would say to anybody listening is do not 
look at this as just another slasher horror flick. Mm-hmm. This is something special in the genre. So if you have any, oh, absolutely, it's interest, not a horror, it's not a slasher flick yeah, at all. This is not all. what what it looks like, and it was it was marketed this way intentionally. I think you mentioned mm-hmm. to me that Joss Whedon specifically oversaw all the trailers. Yeah, so. to like, and, make, and actually, all the trailers that you've seen. Only show the first ten minutes of the movie. You actually do not. Yeah. Uh, from the theatrical trailer, supposedly you don't see anything from after that point. So, and and the stuff that you think you guess, like oh, I bet there's some kind of government thing going on that's in the trailer. You find that out in the first two minutes. You didn't figure shit out. Mm. <laughs> you know, and Bradley all- <laughs> Whitford is so fucking awesome funny in this movie. Oh yeah, he's so funny. Oh yeah, my god, awesome. he had me almost on the floor. <laughs> and the and the other guy that his. Harder. Yeah, the, the older guy was funny too. Oh, Richard Jenkins, yeah, the, the yeah. dead guy from Six Feet Under. Yeah, yeah. Oh god, it was so good. Oh god, it was good, but yeah, fantastic. And I was shocked at how many Whedon alum were sprinkled it amongst the cast. And I was actually shocked Felicia Day didn't play the the redhead young character in this. I was shocked that Nathan Fillion never popped up. <laughs> but like I said. So there's four of us, and I give it a 9 out of 10. So all four of us gave it 9 out of 10. It's so, fantastic. And, and just so you guys are very clear that are listening, there's two of us that, yes, we love Joss Whedon and the house that Whedon built, who's also <laughs> behind the Avengers, which I'm still confused. Oh, my hard-on for the Avengers got even harder <laughs> Let me after f- seeing how good this was. <laughs> Calm down, brother. <laughs> so there's two of us that are obviously Whedon, Whedon ask, and that's me and uh, – or that's Justin and I. But Scott and Scott kind of knows some of his stuff, so he likes him a little bit. And Brian kind of knows some of his stuff, so he likes him a little bit. But they, they are not fans by any means. They're just guys that kind of know his work. Mm-hmm. So that's four completely different perspectives saying it's a kick-ass horror movie. You should all check and, it out. And it's, <laughs> and, and it's been really hard to get four of us to agree. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Especially this highly. That's, that's I, four I think nine. the last right. one is Mission Impossible, mm-hmm. really. Mission Don't Imp- let this suffer John Carter's fate, please. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> you should you should definitely check it out. It's it's a really it's a really clever movie. So we all give it nine out of ten. Yep. The next film that we I just me saw was Lockout. Lockout is it's kind of hard to please well, tell me it's good. I, let me. All right, you guys know who Guy Pierce is right. He was in Memento mm-hmm. years ago. Well, he still looks the exact same. So apparently he's <laughs> stuck in a time vacuum. But he plays Snow. And I don't mean that old '80s rapper. I mean Snow. He's a. Uh, mean he's, he's in Game of Thrones. Oh God! John, John he Snow? has. He has. You just have to mention that hey, fucking bastard. show. <laughs> he has one name, only one name. His name is Snow. What's my first name? Snow. Last name Snow. And this comes up a couple times, but he's basically a falsely convicted government agent who gets one last shot at freedom if he agrees to go rescue the president's daughter, Emily Warnock, who's played by Maggie Grace, and she's been taken hostage above a maximum security prison in space. First things first, Maggie Grace, that chick gets taken a I was lot. just going to say that. <laughs> Every movie she's in, apparently, she gets taken. She gets kidnapped at some point. Lock her oh, in a cage so she can't be taken no more. <laughs> Does Guy Pierce say anything about it? He has a specific set of skills? <laughs> he doesn't. No. Um, this, is, this movie is a complete B-movie throwback to Escape from New York. If you are a fan from Escape from New York, you will like this movie. And it all it basically steals the entire plot from Escape from L.A., what little plot there was. I mean, President's Daughter gets kidnapped. One man who doesn't want to gets sent in to save him, save her. Guy Pierce basically plays Snake Plissken, or the same kind of character, but he he makes the character his own. Justin, you love this, you love that series, right? Which one? Escape from New York, Escape from L.A. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It if you like those movies, you will like this movie. It's very much a, a total B movie throwback. Low budget. I see this. Oh, you got to see it. It's low budget, but it does wonders with what the, the film has to work with. It actually looks pretty decent. It, the trailers don't look good, but the movie itself actually looks pretty good for the most part. The only problem I had with the whole movie, because I thought actually the action was really good. I thought Guy Pierce kicked ass and he's ripped in this movie, but he does a great, you know, anti-hero. I wish they'd give him another, another shot at something like this. Um, the ending feels a little rushed and because it doesn't end quite as, dramatically as i hope but o- overall i mean it, it does it the best it can it's an entertaining throwback not high quality it's not a summer blast blockbuster it's not a critical darling you know you're not gonna see a bunch of critics raving about it but it's just enough clever beats and action scenes plus a really good action hero term by guy pierce to make it like a fun recommendable flick i really wish it would do better so it could he could come back in a sequel and maybe get another shot at this but go save the president's son 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, out of 10, I'd give it seven. Wow. So Could he give hmm. Riddick a run for his money? Uh, actually, Guy Pierce was really good. I was shocked. I was absolutely, because I know, I know Guy Pierce. I mean, obviously I've seen his work in a lot of movies. Um, the last few years, he hasn't done anything that impressed me really. He's kind of stayed off the map and done a lot of indie fare and that sort of thing. And he hasn't done anything that would be considered popular by any means. Um, the last thing I really liked him in was LA, no- um, or not LA, no- LA Confidential. <laughs> LA Confidential. And, you know, it's still amazing. He looks the same. He really does. He's, he's sold his soul to someone because that dude looks good. And he is freaking ripped. I've never, I've seen him in so many movies. I've never seen him ripped before. And he's ripped. Just a good movie. Ra- Sorry. Uh, Ravenous is another good movie with him. Oh, I never saw Ravenous. Oh, no, that was good. Is it? It's an interesting oh. plot. It's definitely it's, the kind it's of. It's got the, uh, the blonde headed guy, Neil McDonough from uh, oh, the bad guy from yeah. Justified. Robert Quarles from Justified? Yep. Well. If you guys get a chance and you want to see something that's definitely a throwback to like 80s B movies and stuff, go see Lockout. 7 out of 10. And real quick, this is what we call our speed round. So basically anything that we saw that we've talked about before or is on new to DVD, Scott saw Straw Dogs. Mm-hmm. What do you think? I uh, this is a really interesting movie. It's a remake of the of the 1971 movie with with Dustin Hoffman, but instead oh. it's uh James Marsden and Kate Bosworth. Um it's a really is a really dark movie. Uh it's kind of a Rednecks versus the LA guys kind of thing. <laughs> okay. For, you know, this is lightning round. I'm trying to yep. be succinct. Um, should I be offended? By no, that not at all. Okay. No, you should, be a, you should embrace it. Uh, it's a, it's a, th- this movie goes to some real dark places. Definitely earns you, you called your segment Brian's trailer park. <laughs> I don't think you should be offended. Sorry, Scott. Fair, fair enough. This, this movie goes to some pretty dark places. It actually earns its R rating pretty well. Um, and, I, I didn't even know it was a remake until after I saw it, and I learned that the, that they went some places in the '71 flick, which at its time was a big deal, and they kind of mirrored that a lot in this movie. Um, obviously, just just get, kind of gave it a, a shot in the arm with the remake. Um, but there's, it, it's very gruesome. It's very um, some messed up stuff happens. Um, basically, James Marsden's character is uh, L.A. writer that brings his wife back to her hometown, to where they're going to move, so he can he can write. And basically, they get run into some trouble with some of the. Uh, um, the lo- local people there, so it gets it gets messed up. There basically is a you know a shootout at the end in the in the house, and and bad things happen, and some real gruesome stuff takes place. So um, it, it was interesting. I, I have definitely enjoyed watching it, especially I don't know. I, I'm kind of a nerdy glasses wearing kind of guy, and seeing him, you know, trash up a bunch of meatheads was kind of fun for me. So. <laughs> What'd you give it out of ten? I, I'd probably give it a six, six out of ten. It wasn't great, but it was it was worth the rental. All right. And that's a remake of the Dustin Hoffman movie. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, real quick to box office. Lockout, by the way, debuted in ninth place with $6 million, so they probably will not make a sequel. I'm very sad Locked about that. Lockout again. I know. <laughs> nice. That's, that's That would be a great title. Do it. Make that happen. Um, the Hunger Games was number one again with $21 uh, million. Dropped 36%. It's actually not bad. It's got $336 million in the till. I think they'll make another one. Yeah, they may make one or two. <laughs> the Three Stooges, dear Lord, was number God two. God damn it. $17 million for this piece of shit. You fucking people. It's a bunch of people taking their kids <laughs> because they can't slap them. They want to see what getting slapped looks like, I guess. I, oh, I hate every one of you. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and if you're listening to the show and you watched it, turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't, don't deserve this show. Don't turn it off. He turn does, it off. He doesn't speak for everybody. Unsubscribe. <laughs> no, 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 no. They can turn it off, but they still got to download. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, number three like movie, like that number history. three, was the Cabin in the Woods. So it actually debuted pretty decent. Not great behind the Three Stooges, though. But but a better per screen average. So it actually made more money per screen. If it would have had more screens, it would have made more money. Fourteen point seven million. And I'm sorry. I don't care how you you justify that. That that's a tragedy. <laughs> <sighs> well, and here's God. here's an even more interesting tidbit in China, which is a vastly growing market. The number one movie it just became it just broke all the records and became the number one opening there of all time. Titanic 3D <laughs> made sixty seven million dollars in China. 
This, this is legitimate weekend. money and mm-hmm. not them pirating shit? Yeah, that's like legitimate money. It's the biggest opening ever in China. It beat uh, Transformers Dark Side of the Moon or whatever. $67 million. Wow. I think at this point, Cameron could just build a Titanic and crash the fucker and afford it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it for, uh, for Box Office. Let's go to upcoming attractions with Justin. All right. Well, we've got four of them coming up uh, on April 27th. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the five-year engagement. It's a romantic comedy starring Jason Siegel and Emily Blunt and was directed by Nicholas Stoller, who some of you might remember as a director of such films as Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Get Him to the Greek. It's the story of a couple whose relationship becomes strained when their engagement is continually extended. Scott, I don't know a lot about strained relationships. I can't guess you do either, but what do you think about this film? I, I think it looks like it's going to be a cute comedy, but uh, I don't see it being nearly as funny as, as some of the other ones that you mentioned. Um, I, it, it'll, be, it'll be fun. The family banter, that kind of stuff is, is interesting, so, but I think this is a movie that's going to make a funny trailer more than it's going to make a funny movie. I don't know. I liked Jason Siegel, and I, I think what Nick Stoller did with Forgetting Sarah Marshall and with Gim to the Greek was pretty good. So I've got some pretty high hopes that Emily Blunt is funny, cute. She is. I like to think it, it'll do really well. What about you, Aaron? I, well, Justin, here's what I think. Uh, I really want to see uh, – Jason Siegel is great. The guy has a good track record. When it comes to, like, bittersweet romantic comedies, I have faith in him, really. And Emily Blunt – is mildly attractive. I don't think she's a sex pot like everybody else does, but oh, I, she's hot. It's the accent. I, I, yeah, it's the accent. That's oh, that accent does help, though. Yeah, I, I just, I want to see it because I like Jason Segel, and anytime it's a romantic comedy, I can actually get into it with him. And most, yeah, it's fair. most actors I don't get into in this kind of movie. So this movie, this movie will do a lot better than your average rom com mm-hmm. for one for one reason alone. The girl, the little girl. In Katniss. the commercial, shooting a crossbow, says, I'm Katniss, and shoots her in the leg. <laughs> you, throw, you throw a Hunger Games reference in there, Yeah, <laughs> people are going to go see it. It's funny you mention that, Brian, because I, when I watched this trailer for this, it was an older trailer that they, that mm-hmm. they released before. And you watched started... it on the website, right? Yes. Of course. Because which, all website, of these are which website is that? <laughs> TheHollywoodOutsider.com. Well, the version I saw, the little girl actually says, I'm Pocahontas, instead. And I'm wondering if that was changed well, after I'm the. Well, sure, it was changed for the trailer. Yeah, yeah like they didn't want to like because like nobody was going to know who Katniss was six months ago when that trailer was first released. No, it probably was Pocahontas. They just changed it because Hunger Games became huge. Right. So I thought that was kind of and, it, and what's funny is that in the in the comments under the under the trailer I saw someone was upset about that. Oh come on, you you got rid of the Hunger Games reference. Come on, they're they're upset about that. I, just, oh. I don't know. Come on, I like the Hunger Games, but people seriously. live to be pissed off on the internet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, next up we have The Pirates! Exclamation point. Okay? Band of Misfits. Uh, <laughs> this is a stop-motion animated film from Sony Pictures. Uh, voice work's done by a bevy of UK actors, such as Hugh Grant, uh, Brandon Gleeson, David Tennant, Brian Blessed, uh, Amelda Stanton, and it's directed by Peter Lord, who is most famous for Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run. Uh, Hugh Grant stars in his first animated role as the pirate captain, uh, a boundlessly enthusiastic, if somewhat less than successful, terror of the high seas, with a ragtag group at his side and seemingly blind to the impossible odds stacked against him, the captain has one dream: to beat his bi- his bitter rivals, Black Bellamy and Cutlass Liz, to the much coveted Pirate of the Year award. Brian, you seem like you probably could have been a pirate in a past life. Arg. Let's see you on this. Arg. <laughs> yeah. You guys are fucking freaking me out right now. (laughs) Yeah, you know, initially when I saw this, I was like, ah, this this is just not a you know, not really up my alley, but but with the voice talent they have in this, I kinda wanna see it. Now I'm not gonna pay ten bucks to go see this in the theater. You know, I'll I'll catch it on cable or something like that. But I mean there's a lot of good actors in this and and a lot of British actors that I like. I like Brian Blessed, uh David Tennant. Um, the doctor, from, exactly from Doctor Who, uh, and it's you know these these Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run type of movies they are in a in, they're not exactly like the Pixar uh, animated movies and stuff mm-hmm. they're not as pretty but there is something about the animation that that kind of brings you back to the animation when we were kids hmm. without it 
I guess without that, that certain realism, hmm. you know, a lot of these animations have now it's, it's almost, I don't want to say real looking because I mean, it's obviously animated, but they are so beautiful and so detailed that you, you just kind of forget that you're watching a cartoon. These, you know, you're watching a cartoon and it kind of takes you back to those cartoons when we were kids. So again, I'll probably wait for cable for this, but it's, um, but the cast intrigues me and, uh, I like pirates. I have no so. desire whatsoever to see this. Zero. None. None. It, it's, I'm kind of on, on your boat, um, Aaron. It's <laughs> Ryan. Pardon the pun. Pun intended. Arr, get aboard there, matey. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of those that, like, if I had a niece or nephew, I wouldn't, I would, wouldn't suffer through it. It would be, I would still get some enjoyment out of it, but I don't have a whole lot of desire to see it. I, I, but then again, I, I didn't get into Wallace and Gromit or the Chicken Run. Yeah. I'm, the, I don't know. I'm dropping anchor on this one. Fuck that. <laughs> I'm tossing this in overboard. Man overboard. Yeah, I watched the trailer again, and it it was cute enough. It's it's not one I want to add to my collection, but I, I could see myself easily giving it a rental one night when I'm smoking a spleef and just need something to watch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Before wow. I incriminate myself further, let's move on. Uh, the next one coming up is The Raven, which is a it's a thriller directed by James McTeague, who some of you might remember he directed V for Vendetta. Uh, he also did uh, Ninja Assassin, which I think I'm the only person I know of who actually enjoyed that film. Yep. Uh, it's it stars John Cusack, Alice Eve, oh god, and uh, Oliver Jackson Cohen. It's a fictionalized account of the last days of Edgar Allan Poe's life, uh, in which the poet and author played by Cusack, pursues a serial killer whose murders mirror those imposed stories. Whenever I see the trailer, it really reminds me of those Sherlock Holmes trailers, and it makes me think that that's kind of the audience they're going for, and Aaron, since you're a big fan of the the Sherlock Holmes stories, and you seem to like the movies well enough, what do you think of this? Does this blow your skirt up? Um, It makes me take my pants off. I really want to see it. I'm dying to see it. Yeah. Dude, I love, I love Edgar Allan Poe. I'm not convinced they're going to do it justice, but I really want to see their take on it. And I love macabre writers, and he's a very macabre writer. And if they, if they actually utilize his stories, you know, like the Telltale Heart and that sort of thing, I think that would be fantastic. They, there's really a lot of things they could do that's clever with this. I'm concerned that they're going to make it a run-of-the-mill murder mystery, but I really want to see it. I mean, I, I will be there when it opens. Absolutely. I think I'd be a lot more interested if it wasn't John Cusack. For some reason, yeah, if he's in a comedy, I want to see it. But as a serious role, I just don't buy him in a thriller. It reminds me of Sleepy don't. Hollow very much. Very much of Sleepy uh, Hollow. A little bit. Or a from little Hell. Bit. From Hell, maybe. Maybe that's maybe any Johnny Depp movie before he became real popular. Maybe they should have got Depp for the for Poe. Then I would have liked Depp. I think actually more than Cusack, but. I'm my mom really wants to see this, and uh, I I might just take her to go see this. This is one of my honorable mentions for most anticipated movies of, of 2012, mm-hmm. and I don't know. We were allowed may- honorable mentions because I thought Aaron fucking put the kibosh on that. <laughs> well, I, I had them ready. I we just didn't talk about it on the show, but um, <laughs> it, I was really excited put his about his boot heel down on that shit. <laughs> Dictatorship. <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe I'm just getting oversaturated, but I, I've, I see this trailer everywhere I go. Every movie I see, this is in there. I'm seeing a mm-hmm. lot of commercials for it. I'm just feeling like I'm already tired of this of this movie. I don't know. I, I, I obviously haven't seen it, and I probably will see it, but um, it rem- you guys said it reminded you of From Hell and, and mm-hmm. other ones. It reminds me of Identity for some reason. That other, uh, really? Identity. Yeah. And I think – and my worry is that they're going to take the story a little bit of that route. They're going to stick him in a hotel room? No, I don't want to. I don't want to ruin. <laughs> oh, I see movie. where you're going. So I see what you're saying. I don't know. See, I thought you know, I thought he was good in in identity. Oh yeah, I I didn't have any, any problem with so, him. I'm just I'm so talking I, about the story itself. Yeah, I'm, but I you know I mean he's there is something about him though that that does kind of take away from maybe a little bit of credibility for the character. Not you know not not doubting his acting ability. I think he's a really good actor, but. You know, it's kind of like seeing Hugh Grant in this type of role. It's like, eh, I don't know if I can really believe him. Right. But, but I thought, he, you know, but he has done other stuff like Identity and what was the 1408 or something like that? Yeah, the, that was okay. the hotel room movie. 
Yeah. I was 14 Which, away. Don't, let's not forget away? Con Air. Uh, let's not forget I want my two dollars. Let's not forget. Like that. I, I forgot John Cusack. But that's a comedy, and that's fucking funny. <laughs> the Grifters. He's he was a very good dramatic actor in the Grifters. I just don't know why they didn't hire Jeremy Renner to play this. Uh, he was doing The Bourne or <laughs> The Avengers or some other series that he was trying to steal. <laughs> yeah, the Hunger only games, thing that really kind of threw me off is in the description of the movie. They talk about this being an account of Poe's last days. So. I don't know. Is that going to spoil the end, or does that mean if this is successful, <laughs> he, you know, he, and and there won't be any sequel possibilities? I don't know. I don't know. Let's find we'll out. Find out. All right. Well, the last film we're going to talk about is Safe. Safe's an action film written and directed by Boaz Yakin, whose only real directorial effort of note was uh, Remember the Titans, uh, as well as writing the recent uh, Prince of Persia film. Safe stars Jason Statham as a former NYPD cop who rescues a 12-year-old Chinese girl and then must fight the triads, the Russian mafia, high-level corp- uh, corrupt New York City politicians, as well as the police. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely lots of potential for ass kicking and copious bullets. Brian, you and I seem to really be the the huge uh, action buffs amongst the four of us. So I think we all enjoy them. But I want you to tell me first what you think of this one. Well, I, I think it looks like just another Jason Statham movie, <laughs> mm-hmm. which ain't bad on its own. Which, no, 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 it's not. It's not. And I, I mean, you're guaranteed a lot of action, you know, a lot of cool fight scenes, that kind of stuff. The uh, I just think it's funny that he's got to be driving around with another young Asian girl in his car after after Transporter One. So who <laughs> seems like a horrible actress, by the way. The, the little girl in this trailer is awful, just awful. So, wow, you want to kick children? Oh, yeah. Nice. All right, oh, there. I'm sorry, all the kids in Next China. Next will be the, telling us there's no Santa Claus or Easter Bunny. <laughs> there's not, and Kermit the Frog wears dresses. I don't understand why they can't find a quality young actress that's Asian. I'm sure China has plenty of them. Because this this girl is awful, awful. I could have went to Walmart in front of her. She was awful. Did you not watch the God, trailer? You're so fucking critical, Jesus. You're such a hater. I'm such a hater. I'm a hater. I don't like bad Chinese veins. children actors. Yeah. I don't even know how you enjoy movies anymore. <laughs> in movies, life. How do you not enjoy life? I'm with Brian though. As far as like these Jason Statham movies, just be, are becoming very cookie cutter. I like they just start becoming. Or, but well, becoming they are. I mean, just start calling them Jason Statham one, Jason Statham two, and instead of <laughs> why even call them safe, just just call it. Put a Jason Statham with a number behind it. I think that's what he saw when he saw the script. He's like, "Oh, this is safe. I'll do it." And they're like, "Oh, hey, that'd be a good title." Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I I like Jason Statham. I, I actually do like him as an actor. He just he just gets. I don't know about as an actor, but as you, a, I, I liked kicker. him. I liked him in Snatch. Yeah. Oh, he was so good in Snatch. Yeah. Too. St- you know, lock, lock stock, stock and two smoke. smoking yeah. barrels. Mm-hmm. Shit, the guy can't act. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't, I don't know why they want to cast him as an NYPD cop. He's, he's obviously British. Even trying an American accent, <laughs> he sounds British. Figure out some other reason for him to be there. And the thing I liked about what, in your description is that apparently he's fighting everyone in New York City. Everyone. Like, they're just trying to amp it up because in every movie, he just keeps fighting more and more people. So now at this point, they're just, all right, Jason, here's the pitch. You're going to fight New York. Uh, <laughs> who am I going to fight New York? You're going to fight everyone. Everybody. Yeah. And then he jumps on board. I think he just went Australian a little bit. I right? don't know what he is. He's fucking. All I'm saying is if they ever do a Saints Row movie, <laughs> this motherfucker's got to be running Saints Row. They, they stopped calling it a British accent. It's basically just a Jason Statham accent. <laughs> but I like Statham. I think the dude has got charisma just oozing out of every oh, big pore. Time. So I, I don't know if I'll go to theaters to see this, but it'll definitely be something I'd watch uh, when it hits uh, rentals. You, you know what I really wish would happen with him? Because I do like him in a lot of things. Is If if he would stop doing just the stoic... Like he, I'm very concerned he's going the Bruce Willis route, who I used to love Bruce Willis, but like you said earlier, he's just become Bruce Willis. Right. Well, Jason Statham is becoming like Jason Statham or Steven Seagal or any of those other guys that used to have some charisma and then threw it away. If you go watch, um, was it The Italian Job or even The Expendables, you know, when, when uh, Stallone got him to loosen up a little bit and have some fun, when he starts smiling and actually having fun, he's cool to watch. I love watching him because he seems like this guy's having just as much fun as I'm having. Mm-hmm. But like in other movies where he's just become this stoic action hero just playing Jason Statham, I get bored. Because, yeah, it's cool seeing him kick ass, but I saw that in every other movie you did. So bring bring the real, bring Handsome Rob, man. 
Bring Handsome Rob. <laughs> I hear you. All right, guys. Well, of those four films, uh, the five-year engagement, The Pirates, Band of Misfits, The Raven, and Safe, which of these four are you wanting to see the most? Aaron, go first. The Raven. I picked The Raven. Scotty? I'm As much as I said I'm, I'm oversaturated, I'm going to say The Raven as well. Brian? I'll go for The Raven also. Mm. Uh-oh. <laughs> I actually have to go The Five-Year Engagement. Okay. I'm really surprised you'd pick that because you don't like seeing comedies in the theater, do you? It's I, I don't, but Jason Segel I find incredibly charismatic. The trailer just made me giggle from beginning to end. And uh, The Raven, while it looks really cool, I have definite reservations about the actor involved. It looks incredibly dark, and I am so tired. And I don't mean dark as in tone. I mean dark as in fucking lots of shadows and black screens and at night. And I'm tired of movies that are so drenched in dark colors. Five-year engagement looks light, bright, funny. That would be the one of these four I would most like to see. Okay. So that's three for The Raven and one for five-year engagement. Let's see what happens. Thanks, Justin. Uh, What's this movie? This week on What's This Movie? uh, First off, last week's answer was Reservoir Dogs, which only one person got right. I'm shocked. Yeah, I thought a lot surprised. more people would get that. But Scott M., you got it right, as you seem to always do every week. <laughs> um, <laughs> this week, it's Brian's clip. Brian? Yeah, I'll. Uh, this is my clip. I got tired of tossing up. You know, we've been tossing up some softballs for the listeners here <laughs> lately. And I went I went a little deeper this time. It's, a popular, deep it, it's, a, it's a popular movie. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a well-known movie, but it's not one that I don't, I don't think many people will just pick up right off the bat. So uh, if you do know what it is, tweet us at H underscore outsider, or you can email us at feedback at the Hollywood outsider dot com. Outsider. 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 Sorry. Outhouse. <laughs> so once again, that's feedback at the Hollywood outsider dot com. Just for the southern impaired. Okay. <laughs> Here's your clip. Why can't you treat me? The way I would be treated by any stranger on the street. Because I am not one of your fans. Okay, if you guys think you know what that clip was, uh, make sure to send us an email, feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com, or reach us on Twitter, H underscore Outsider. We'll read your name next week. And that was a hard one, so thanks, Brian. Thanks for the hard one, Brian. (laughs) Wow. Okay, moving on to the TV home video news. The Couch. First piece, Mitt Romney was invited on Saturday Night Live. My question, should he do it? No. No. (laughs) <laughs> Why not? No, and it's 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 really got nothing to do with political affiliations or anything like that. He's more than proved over the last few months that he sucks at humor. Yes, and I think for your generally speaking, I think it's a great idea to do that to sh- kind of show a softer side because one of the better people to have that they have on there occasionally is 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 the uh, the news guy Brian Williams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he he's so dr- you know he's so monotone and so kind of dry on the on the news but then you see him cutting up on saturday night live and he's freaking hilarious so but mitt romney has just proven that he's absolutely horrible at comedy one of his funny jokes was a story about how his dad shut down a plant in wisconsin Mm -hmm. it's it's, he just he just you know don't do it and even if you write material for him I think the guy is just too much of a, a robot to pull off any kind of humor. I, 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 the guy might as well be standing in Disneyland's The Hall of Presidents, but <laughs> thankfully not as president. He's just so robotic, it's obnoxious. I think from an entertainment standpoint, it's a terrible idea. It's mm-hmm. not going to be in, exciting to watch at all. I'd be surprised how many people actually do watch it. Mm-hmm. But from a, I think a lot of people would watch it. Well, yeah, I I won't. I mean, I don't, but I don't watch Saturday Night Live regularly either. Either I got better things to do on Saturday night than but watch TV. Yeah, I mean, I I record it and then watch it usually the next day or or Monday or what have you. But it's really kind of a lose lose situation. 
I because agree. if it goes on there, he, he's going to he's going to look like an idiot. They're going to make him look like an idiot. It's a very uh, left leaning, left leaning politically show. And he's not going to realize it. No, he realizes it. Come on. It, right, it, right. He's walking into the lines in. But if he doesn't go, then he looks like a pussy. Yeah. At this point, because they publicly invited him, I think he's probably going to have to to some degree. Yep. But he's got to be very, very smart about what he does because he could easily look like um, Tina Fey's Sarah Palin impersonation. You know, <laughs> he, the whole reason he wants to do it, I'm sure, is because he doesn't come across as warm and fuzzy like he wants to. And Obama has that going for him. So he wants to go and be a little bit more, hey, I'm one of you guys. Fuck that. Just admit you're filthy rich and you're never going to be one of us. I'm cool with that. You know, just yep. <laughs> own up. That's... Don't we all have garages with elevators in them? Come on. <laughs> That's the kind of skit he needs to do. He needs to go out there and just totally mock his image. If he doesn't do that, I don't think he should do it. Because I think he's got to be ready to go all in. But if he does, that's good for for him politically. It can be. It can make him more. Honestly, I think if he mocked the stuff that people are saying about him, it would make him more relatable. Mm -hmm. Whether people realize it or not. I think it would make him more of a person. Yeah. But I don't think he's heading down to Liquorville, though. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chevy Chase and community creator Dan Harmon have engaged in a little public battle. Uh, apparently, Chevy didn't like some of the direction that the show was going or didn't like some of the jokes. So he basically left a voicemail for Dan Harmon, who then aired it to other people. And it basically caught wind and... Uh, set storm. Justin, you know a little bit more about this than I do, so why don't you go over it? Well, it, it's it's stupid. First off, Chevy Chase left this thing, from what I've read, left this voicemail a year ago. So this is already kind of old news. Uh, I I've you know I I watch the show. I love Community, and so I kind of follow some of the news. It's no secret that Chevy Chase has not been incredibly happy with being on it but i don't know why all of a sudden dan harman who created the show writes it does direction why he would a year later suddenly have people listen to this voicemail if this was left a year ago they've obviously worked together since then whatever animosity exists between them has either been push to the wayside it's been fixed or they've all just decided fuck it i hate you but we're working <laughs> together and let's move on i don't know why dan Harmon decided to do this that said the voicemail says what it says chevy chase seems to be an incredibly arrogant asshole i think the only reason he was brought on the community was to try and give it you know one name to lend it some kind of credibility because mm -hmm. really the, the lead actor in it is um, Joe, McHale. Joe McHale and most people only know him from the soup and how many people watch that as compared to your average American sitcom. So they needed a name. They got Chevy Chase, but Chevy Chase, I'm sorry, you're not funny. And when you are funny, it's strictly in an ensemble setting. I have never seen you be funny on your own in a film you oh. have got to be surrounded by other fletch. people fletch fletch aside okay because if you don't say fletch i will punch you in the balls fletch aside the guy needs people around him to really kind of be funny so it's i i think community is brilliant so whatever complaints he has regarding the writing or directing of the show i think he's got his head up his ass because it's it's my favorite comedy airing today i will say chevy chase in the 80s was extremely funny I think the Chevy Chase that was funny uh, is gone. And I think very much like I think Bill Murray, I think their time is done. And I think they're both living like they still were in the 80s. They both are those kind of actors that think that they're above a lot of other people. And and the voicemail, if you can find it, it's on HollywoodReporter.com Hollywood and a few other sites. But it's just pathetic. It really is. It's like, you know what, old man River, shut the fuck up. Go back in your box. I can't defend you anymore. You know, where I used to, I would have, because I used to love Chevy Chase back in the day, because obviously I like sarcasm. And that's really, that's his shtick. That's what he does. Now, are you saying he's lost the humor edge himself, or are you saying that that humor just doesn't work in today? No, no, no. No, I think the humor completely works. I mean, there's a ton of comedians and whatnot that get by on sarcasm. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that he's lost his edge. I mean, I think he's a little funny on community, which obviously that is the script, because from the voicemail, you can tell that they're not letting him ad lib. Well, he's funny on the show because of the script, therefore, and therefore maybe he should just be quiet and do what he's told for once. You know, you're not the Chevy Chase of the 80s anymore. Yeah, just you're the... not doing spies like us anymore, bro. No. Yeah. 
I don't know. I, I just think it, it, I agree with Justin, which doesn't happen very often. And, and he was completely arrogant and totally. Somebody marked this on the calendar. Mm-hmm. Write that shit down. Well, moving on Tron uprising. <laughs> I had no idea this was even going on, but apparently there's an animated series coming out in June and the trailer just hit. It's on USA today. This kind of interests me, except the fact that I just don't watch these kind of shows. I'm not going to watch an animated. Well, you're a huge Tron fan. Though, I right? am, but I still am not going to. I'm. I, I don't see me watching this. I mean, I'm a huge Star Wars fan too, and I never watched any of the Clone Wars. What if you were on <sighs> vacation, out, bro? What if I were on vacation? Yeah. I'd probably be playing video games. All right, good call. Um, and watching Justified. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just. I'll bet you it'll look really gorgeous, but I don't think it'll top the 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 films. Obviously, or the last film. Um, but who knows? The writing could get could get better. It'd be interesting to see where it goes. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe I'll give it a shot. But I'm just it's hard for me to get excited about an animated TV show at 32 years old. Justin, would you watch this? I, I shit, yeah, I'll watch it. I, I I haven't lately kept up with the Clone Wars, but I did watch it when it was strictly animation, and then for the first couple of seasons when it went to CGI. Um, I I really don't quite know why I. I tailored off watching it but i enjoyed the clone wars uh, i thought they were fun meant for kids though they really had some some darkness to them this tron uprising trailer looks good i'm glad they got bruce boxleitner in there to do the voice of tron or whatever his name changed into i can't recall off the top of my head it, it looks cool and there's a lot of material to, that needs to be covered between tron and tron legacy i'm curious to see how they do it so yeah yeah i'll watch it okay Fair Especially enough. if Daft Punk's going to continue to do the music. <laughs> well, let's move on to what's new on DVD. Scott, what's coming out? Well, this is going to be for uh, the week of April 24th, so these movies will be coming out on that date. We've got uh, Contraband, Pariah, um, 11, 11, 11. Um, also The Innkeepers, Dark Tide, Return, and lastly, Let the Bullets Fly. Any of those you want to see? Not Mar- even a little bit. Marky Mark, bitch. <sighs> Contraband. Maybe I I might I'll do that like one of those uh, Sunday when I'm hungover kind of things like Ryan says. <laughs> I like <laughs> which is every Sunday. <laughs> no, as you're scrubbing off Sharpie, as I like to call it Sharpie Sunday. <laughs> Sharpie Sunday. <laughs> Break out the lava soap. Ooh yeah, hit me with that unknown shit. Flashback. Each week we have a little known or obscure film that one of our podcasters picks, and so that basically we can leave you with. So that you can... What are you looking for, Scott? I was looking for the DVD. No, I don't have it with me. Oh, I'm okay. actually going off my mind. Are you? Yeah, because it's my first. turn this week. My flashback this week is going to be a 2005 movie called The Descent. Hmm. Uh, the Descent is a, about a group of women friends who decide to go cave diving. Don't we all want to do that at some point? <laughs> no, we don't. Not after seeing this movie, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> As things often do in horror movies, things go horribly awry when the women get trapped in the cave and ultimately realize they are being pursued by creatures inside the cave. Here's why I like the movie. Okay, it's it's you can find it on DVD or Blu-ray. It's easy to find. It's unique because it is a horror film, but all the cat the entire cast is women. It's there's no uh, male hero just waiting to save them or anything else. It, it's all women, and it's not like whiny bitches that sit around and complain and scream and yelp and everything else. They're all headstrong, smart women, and they're fighters. So they're all trapped in this cave. A couple of them obviously are more scared than others, but. They're they're basically strong women. They're not stereotypes. The movie's not gory at all. It's it's mostly a tension style of horror, which means you know you're basically on the edge of your seat, wondering what's going to happen. Even though there's like a supernatural element by adding the, the the creatures to the film, it's really more about the surviving and and some of the selfish choices they make in order to survive. And also, I really love the ending in this flick. the The ending is one of those that when the whole movie plays out. When you're all done, and the, the, there's a lot of tension. I mean, it's a really tense movie, I think, my personal opinion. But when you get to the very end, as soon as it's over, you go, what the fuck just happened? It's one of those. Mm-hmm. It's not where a horrible, horribly surprising ending. It's just that it makes you think. And the movie's directed by Neil Marshall, who also did Dog Soldiers. But this one obviously had a little bit bigger budget. So did any of you guys see this? Yeah, I've actually seen it. <clears throat> yeah, I've seen it. What's really cool about it is um, the tense moments are – when non-horror movie things are going on, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, yeah, there's some, there's some definitely creepy, claustrophobic feeling kind of things going on that uh, it's, a, it's a fun little movie. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of those surprise movies. Mm-hmm. 
you didn't you kind of go in not expecting a whole lot but by the end of it you're like damn this is this is pretty good mm -hmm. yeah so if anybody's looking for a, a nice little uh horror flick that's not too gory not too crazy then rent the descent don't let the box fool you or the ladies drip soaking in blood it's really not that gory mm -hmm. and the music for the movie is actually quite good it's in my one of the soundtracks that i listen to when i've been writing that horror novel lately the descent has got a nice dark atmospheric score to it so that helped out too absolutely now let's go to stump the hoe the answer can you repeat the question first, Justin? I can indeed. Lou Ferrigno first played the Hulk in the TV series back in 1977, and he's provided uh, the voice of the Hulk in the upcoming Avengers film. Uh, he's played the Hulk in one capacity or another in almost every version of the character produced since 1977, but he didn't have a hand in the portrayal of the Hulk in which of the following? A, the 1988 telefilm, The Incredible Hulk Returns, the 1996 to 97 animated series, The Incredible Hulk, a, uh, C, Ang Lee's feature film, The Hulk, or D, the more recent Edward Norton, The Incredible Hulk film. Scott, you said D, the Edward Norton Incredible Hulk. Brian and Aaron, you both said A, Ang Lee's. And uh, this week, Brian and Aaron, they get the rubber chicken. It was indeed Ang Lee's feature film, The Hulk. What, what? He did... He did play the security guard. He did not do the voice work of the Hulk, though in Edward Norton's film, he did a security guard again, but he also did the voice work for the Incredible Hulk. Bam! <laughs> Boom! We are good. We should get badges and shit. Got a rubber chicken. <laughs> like, badges. I didn't know badges. we were, I didn't know we were giving we out rubber no chickens. Badges. Which budget is the rubber chickens coming out of? That's what I want to know. Eh, fuck, I'll pay for that. <laughs> Put that on my tab. Well, now we're going to From the Outside In. That's where each, each week we have a, a topic that's on ours or our listeners' minds. And this week, because we're coming up on the Avengers opening, which is coming out May 4th, which is officially the start of the summer blockbuster season now. I mean, really, it used to be June, but now it's May. Eventually, we'll probably start in January at some point. But So we're going to kind of call this the nostalgia episode. Because with summer season lurking, Avengers coming out, because there's so many theaters and movies out now and... So many less memories, I guess you could say. We kind of wanted to talk about and share some of our favorite summer blockbuster memories. So, Justin, why don't you start? Mostly because Scott uh, was getting ready to talk and I felt like cutting him off. <laughs> <laughs> How many do I get to talk about? Because <laughs> I made a fairly extensive list. Well, let's not go too crazy. Just just throw a couple off and then let Brian go and then we'll eventually get to Scott. Uh <laughs> Of every summer blockbuster to ever come out, the one that had me the most pumped, even though my feelings about it have changed since then, episode one, The Phantom Menace, when it came out May 9th Shocker. of 1999, was for me almost a religious experience to get to see this film in theaters, midnight showing. I, I could not have been more thrilled even after seeing it, I was thrilled. It was only years <laughs> later, as uh, the the bloom fell off the rose a bit, that my feelings changed. But as far as a blockbuster summer film, Star Wars Episode One was the film to really get me going. Um, but after I, I looked through a, a good list of, of summer films, the, the earliest one that I can really remember just being psyched as hell for. Uh, came out June 1st, 1984. Anybody have a guess what this film is? Return of the Jedi? No. Oh, wait. June 1st, 84 was mm -hmm. Temple of Doom? Empire. Empire. Ghostbusters. Empire. Oh, bitches. Ghostbusters. Oh. Fucking Ghostbusters. Oh, the trailers were hysterical. Was Return of the Jedi. I loved everybody in this film. It looked so funny. Looked so good. I could not wait to go to the... And I think it actually opened... Was it the same weekend as E.T. or around the same time? Mm -hmm. I think it was. Uh, e. No, E.T. No, e. came out in 82. Have... That came out a couple years earlier. Do what? I, th I think E.T. came out a couple years earlier, I think, didn't it? I don't know. But Ghostbusters was definitely one of the first movies I can really remember being incredibly psyched for. I, I was 11, like 11 and a half. And comedy, ghosts, Slimer... Stay puffed. I mean, fuck. Every time that the commercial came on for it, I was I incredibly psyched. Um, but the last one I'll mention came out June 11th, 1993. 
anybody know uh, what this movie is? Three. I don't know. Mm-mm. Jurassic Park. Oh, mm. good choice. Ugh. Those commercials, the T Rex, the whole premise. I mean, fuck, finally a film that could bring dinosaurs, giant monsters to life on a screen that was believable. Oh, and Steven Spielberg. I could not get into that theater fast enough. And it was an amazing film. And to this day, it still works. It, this could be put in theaters today. Tell the kids it's never been shown before. And I think they would absolutely believe it. There was a current film. It was an incredible mel- melding of CG, practical effects. You can barely tell the difference. Did we Fantastic talk about, summer film. Didn't we talk about that one last week, but one that we'd like to see in a reboot in 3D? Mm-hmm. In the theater. Maybe, yeah. but it was incredible, oh, and I could not wait to see it. Could not. Mm-hmm. Go so ahead. So there you go. I've got a lot more, but <laughs> I'll let you guys talk now. <laughs> go ahead, Brian. Just, just to set the record straight here, E.T. was released in June of 82. That's what I said. 82. Yep. Okay. What? And Ghostbusters was June of, June 11th, was June 7th of 84. Mm-hmm. June eleventh, eighty two was E. T. June seventh, eighty four was uh, Ghostbusters. Man, I was I was three years old. Wow. All right, Brian. Oh, oh. Let's, we're, we're not uh, even we, gonna go we, to Scott now. We were almost <laughs> driving. <laughs> God. You have any memories, Brian? And they don't have to be like just the movies. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's it's mine. Mine really wasn't specific movies necessarily. It was more, you know, growing up in the you know in the deep south. It gets hotter than fuck in the summertime <laughs> and i just remember you know i remember going down you know to the to the theater and watch and, and standing in line like around the building you know you there's you know this was well before you know there was no ordering tickets online <laughs> you know there was no fandango you had to call to find out <laughs> you know what what times the movie were going to start Grab that kind of paper. stuff mm-hmm. uh and and I just you know remember standing in line for hours, you know for for one big movie or another. It's hot, and then you go inside, and the AC has never felt so good. Mm-hmm. And you know you get that big Coke and your your popcorn or your Jew Bears, whatever. <laughs> and uh, you know, and then it's you know you watch your movie and, and you're blown away by it, and you come out pumping your fist because of a Rocky movie or wanting to wanting a light cycle because you just came out of Tron or, or whatever the case is. And then you're instantly blinded by the bright sun. That's, that's out there. Um, I don't know. It was, those are just, I guess kind of the first things that I really thought of was not spe- necessarily specific movies, but the experience and, and that you just don't see nowadays, you know, you nobody standing in line around the back of a movie anymore because the line's so long. Yeah, I, I thought of that too. Only if you do midnight showings, you're going to still get that, right? But even still, but even still, you can order. Like I can order tickets now for the May midnight of May third, May fourth, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it. Of Avengers, yeah. For the Avengers, I can go ahead and order that now, and I can pick them up. You know, a day the day before, and I, all I got to do is just walk in. I remember sitting, hanging out at the mall, and it was wrapped all the way around the mall because it was in the mall right. then to see uh, Return of the Jedi. And we, you just had to pray that you got a, a theater with a seat in it because it was just so crowded. Now you don't have to worry about it. It's some of some of that fun is gone, just gone. Yep. Remember balconies? Yeah, <laughs> I remember seeing Return of the Jedi sitting on a balcony. Scott, you hmm. want to say something? Go ahead. I I think for, we've we've all talked about the midnight showings, and I think that is like some of my best memories. Is like that was the fun thing to do in the summer was to go. See a movie because even though you were seeing it way after any of the critics did, you always felt like you're seeing it before everybody else. Mm-hmm. That and the people that you're in the theater with are are not there just because they want to see you know let's go see whatever movie's playing this weekend. Those people are there because they want to see that movie. Mm-hmm. And you know I'll, I'm not big on the applause because that doesn't make any sense for me like that. But you can feel the people pumped up for that kind of thing. One of the one of the big ones that I put down was The Dark Knight from 2008. The scene at the very beginning of the movie when the Joker and the pencil, mm-hmm. the theater just exploded with shock at yeah. that scene. And those are the kind of things that I love about about those uh, about summer blockbusters. Is going. I I'm not like antisocial and anti people and be quiet during my movie as much as most people. Granted, I don't like people talking and stuff, but I mm-hmm. like 
going to going to comedies and seeing a lot and everybody laughing at the jokes hysterically. I love going to see the the holy shit moments and everybody going holy shit at the same time. Those kind of things are cool to me. Um, but some of my better memories, I have two quick ones. Um, the first one, um, I, I've mentioned it in, on previous shows, but as a kid, I wasn't I wasn't allowed to go to the movies. So anyway, my my biological father, who was not not wanted nothing to do with that, would occasionally, as they started to get a little bit older, started to take me to see movies, and I remember. As a young teenager, going to see Men in Black in the theater, and I was just blown away. First off, I hadn't seen too many movies at all, and that one I had so much fun with. Um, he also took, although it's not a blockbuster, he took me to see Starship Troopers mm-hmm. in the theater, and that was like a big deal because like they had boobs in it when I was you know fourteen. Or long it was. Really I hope they weren't gratuitous boobs because apparently you guys hate that shit. <laughs> But anyway, the I just have one other one other story, and this it's not a summer blockbuster, but it was a blockbuster. The original Shrek. Granted, whether you love it or you hate the movie, I have a funniest story about mm-hmm. this movie. It's so wrong, but it's so funny. I saw this on I believe it was opening weekend with a girl I was dating at the time, and uh, sitting in the theater, and there's a there's a couple of kids a few rows in front of me, and uh, one of them excused himself out of the row and walked towards the front of the theater. No joke took off his trench coat and streaked through the front of the theater <laughs> doing cartwheels yelling I love Shrek before bolting out of the exit door and That's where awesome. a car was waiting for him. It I, it would be a lot more funny if it weren't a kids movie and there were and there were kids in the theater at the time. Oh. But Oh, how old was this kid? He, like um late teens. Wow. Like oh, probably 16, 17. Sure. Um, but I laughed so hard, <laughs> probably more than I should have, but, um, that was, that, that's like my funniest, uh, blockbuster <laughs> Your funniest movie. summer blockbuster memory as a naked guy running in front of you. How is that not funny? Well, that's pretty disturbing and funny at the same time. But it was, yeah, it was, it was really, it was really funny. I kind of felt bad for the... I can't believe that was in a kid's movie. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, like if all the movies you're going to do it, you do it in a kid's movie. Well, if you're trying to get attention. Yeah, but literally, cartwheels. <laughs> that's yelling, a lot of... Yelling, I love Shrek. Yeah, I... I got, that's a lot of things flapping. Right there. <laughs> that whole midnight showing thing you were talking about, I think that's part of what made that episode one so much fun. You know, mm-hmm. we all back then, all us Star Wars fans still had hope. You know, we still had some joy. Was that everybody a in new line? Hope? Yeah. Was that? <laughs> everybody, everybody in line. So many people had lightsabers, dressed up in costumes. And when you're in the sitting, when you finally get to sit down and stormtroopers are walking up and down the aisle and then it finally goes Mm -hmm. dark and that Lucasfilm logo comes up and the cheers that erupt Mm -hmm. 20th century Fox. And then the, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, thunderous applause. I mean, it's stuff like that, Mm -hmm. that to me, I don't care how much of a film nerd you think you are and how much you think you get out of a movie when you're surrounded by passionate fans, to me, that is what movies, that's what film and entertainment is really all about. Not some asshole in the back row writing out his dissertation on what he thinks of the film, Mm -hmm. but really just embracing the fun with people who are as passionate as you are. That's where the real blast comes from. And my turn. One thing I do want to say in terms of midnight show is because we, we all have mentioned them is that, and you're a little younger, Scott, so you, you probably don't remember this, but your experience at a midnight show, the one that, and now we go to midnight shows for the same experience. That's the experience we had on any weekend when a movie came out when we were kids, mm-hmm. because you didn't have as many theaters. So you had all the people that wanted to see it crammed into one theater, waiting, waiting in line, trying to get a ticket. You get in there. No cuts, no cuts. Yeah, no cuts. I mean, you got people fighting for fucking tickets. <laughs> it's angry sometimes. I mean, it's a midnight. It was a midnight show every weekend that something big came out. So the experiences of midnight show. The reason why I love them now, why I love going to midnight shows, is not because I like seeing people dressed up like stormtroopers because that's kind of creepy sometimes. <laughs> but it's because that's the experience I got when I was a kid, and it's nice. That's the only way I can relive it because without any any other time, you you really can't get it mm-hmm. the same kind of experience. But a couple of the ones that I had was one of my favorite memories as a kid was going to. The drive-in with my mom took me to the drive-in for my seventh birthday to see Friday the Thirteenth. My seventh birthday. I guess some people would think wow, that's, that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah, it does. Because um, my birthday was on the thirteenth. I've turned I turned thirteen and thirty on Friday the Thirteenth. So I mean, I did too. Hey, look at that. It, 
it was really surreal to that was my first drive-in that I remember going to and then to see you know something like that that's kind of an intense movie to see when you're seven years old but god it was awesome uh, another kind of a, a cool little nostalgia thing is I remember going when I was a kid to the opening night for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom because I love Indiana Jones and I went with my mom and, and like half my family and at that time my mom and dad weren't they were divorced they ended up getting remarried years later and then when Crystal Skull came out I got to go with my mom and my dad and my kids and that for me was probably even though the movie ended with an alien shitstorm um it was probably one of the most memorable movie nights I've ever had because I, I you know it was just kind of nostalgic for me almost exact same thing <laughs> with mine for for seeing Phantom Menace because like I said my parents didn't let me watch movies mm -hmm. and we were old enough by the time that came out that that was like the first time that I remember going to the movies with both of my parents and my brother all four of us we didn't go to the midnight showing but that was really cool for me because they grew up with Star Wars they had seen them as a kid or not as a kid but you know they, they lived it when it was in the theater I was obviously before my time but it was cool for us to kind of come together as a family and see that together especially for for something that we all love so much so oh, and the last one is I went and took all my kids or all my kids <laughs> all, <laughs> all my <laughs> Dang. All your bastards. All my Here bastards. There, Sean Kemp. <laughs> uh, both of my kids to all the Harry Potter movies. That was That's kind of cool that o over the course of the years, I've actually watched Harry Potter grow along with my my kids because yeah. I took them both when the first that's one cool. came out to everyone since then. So yeah, that was pretty cool. There's some of, kind of, some of our moments. If, if you guys want to email some of your most memorable summer blockbuster moments, um, we'll, we'll – Pick some and read them on, on the air if, if you guys send them to us. So send them to feedback at the com. I hope somebody sends them back to the future because we didn't talk about it and we should have because that movie was so goddamn good. Well, there's a lot of really good summer movies. We don't want so much fun and it came out of nowhere. <laughs> That's true. And Michael J. Fox, then he did Teen Wolf. Remember that? No, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just pretend that, that it never happened. And thank God Eric Stoltz never got the role of Marty McFly. Yeah, that's true. I would have went 88 miles an hour myself. <laughs> well, that is our show. You can uh, always email us at feedback at com. Make sure to stay through the credits for outtakes. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Hollywood Outsider. And you can always find us on the website at the Hollywood Outsider com. I want to thank the podcasters, Brian Williams. Thanks for being here, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Brian's trailer park. We appreciate that. And you can find him on Twitter at Brian WMS. Justin McCumber, thank you, sir. Oh, it is a pleasure to be with you guys as always. Thank you for your wonderful Justin's coming section. <laughs> is that what we're calling that? <laughs> I Justin's don't know, but coming. that seems to be what Brian likes. <laughs> Uh, Justin is also the host of the Dead Robot Society. That's a podcast for, aspir for aspiring writers. Been going for several years. You can also find him on justinmccumber.com. And his book, Haywire, is in uh, is unavailable on Amazon. Wherever else you can find e-books. Scott Clark is the host of the Official Thread Podcast. Hi, Scott. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here. That's a monthly podcast for gamers, and you can find more information at Official Thread. Anything before we cut out? Anyone? Bueller. Buy more Jew Bears. Buy more Jew Bears. They're delicious. Yeah. Make sure you guys put a review on um, iTunes. That really kind of helps us out, get noticed a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The more reviews we can get on iTunes, the more we can get. Um, we can make a better show. We'll make a better show if we get more <laughs> reviews on iTunes. <laughs> <clears throat> Whatever it takes. Make sure to tell your friends, subscribe on iTunes. We'd appreciate that. Zoom, Google Reader, listen on your Stitcher Radio app. We're actually getting a lot of traction on that. And Give us a thumbs up if you do listen there, and, or just any plain old RSS feed. Once again, as always, the next time you go to a theater, make sure to buy popcorn. <laughs> Jesus. Visit, I just wanna go home. You're unable to understand that I'm doing the best I can, and all I know is all I'd rather be home. I'd rather be home. I'd rather be home. 
pop he's got. I like it when you call me Big Papa. <laughs> well, you don't have to I'm tell okay us. If that's, if that, that's what really matters. But is, I'm okay. Is somebody not okay? Did the axle uh, crack on your mom's house? What's What's that? Did the axle crack on your mom's mobile <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, we have been missing that, that wheel for a while, and I think the extra pressure that is, uh, the, you know, that has been being placed on the cinder block. Well, no, you shot that down there. No, you're not going to call it that, <laughs> yeah, but just tell them what you wanted to call it that, what you wanted to call it. Brian's Trailer Park. <laughs> Why not? Why because not? Because it's too, it's That's too much. That's fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> that that is seriously Scotty perfect. Scotty and I are overriding, Aaron. <laughs> oh, man. You got... We are staging a coup up in this bitch. <laughs> that, that's too good, man. That's <laughs> really good. Brian's trailer park. Don't listen to him. <laughs> I think I'm saddened that you guys all think that's super funny. Oh, it's fucking funny. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how you think it's not. I'm man. afraid that it's funny the first time. It's not funny after that. That's what I'm afraid of. You know, kind of like doing a deliverance theme every week. That's not funny. No, I, I mean, just, just no. But that it. joke ran for six months. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for something that's not funny, it sure as hell stuck around a while. I had two bastard two. children on a wedlock. Wow, boy, <clears throat> you're really Christian. I didn't say I was good at it. <laughs> From two different uh, women. Yeah, two different women. Fucking whore. <laughs> Fucking popular. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm ready when you guys are. Ready, ready. I'm ready. God damn it. <laughs> oh, I thought we were all supposed to answer. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> ready? Yeah. All right. This is the Hollywood... <laughs> Are you good? You did like two seconds of it. (laughs) (laughs) That girl is poison. I know is all I'd rather be on.